Welcome to Thesen am Tresen, the Still Logistics Talk. And this is your host for today, journalist and communication expert for logistical topics, Tilo Jagel. Hello and welcome everyone. We're here at the Hotel Interconti in Berlin on the 14th floor with a nice view at the Still Studio. Welcome also to all of you watching from home from your screens. We've got the third part of our Thesen am Tresen, our over-the-counter logistics talks here in Berlin. And we've got great guests uh, once again here with us today that I'm going to introduce you to. We've got Professor Julia Arlinghaus. She's the head of the Fraunhofer Institute for Factory operation and automation in Magdeburg in Germany. Welcome to you. And we've got uh, from Hamburg, Marina Hein. She's the vice president for international key account solutions at Kion ITS in the Europe, Middle East and Africa region. Welcome. And last but not least, we've got Kevin Koofs, the um, CEO uh, of Hermes Fulfillment from Hamburg. Welcome. All right, we're talking about automation today. The um, title is a bit provocative. Um, we're calling it a digital soft land. So basically, a bad job at digitization is still a job badly done. How to avoid automating the wrong way. But before we get started, what would you like to drink? We've got tea and water for you. and one tea for the gentleman. All right, if we look at the numbers and figures a little bit, then we'll see that the production volume in intralogistics during the COVID pandemic has remained quite high. Um, we're talking 22 billion here. Uh, German is uh, coming out at number three. China and uh, the US are, of course, of course, slightly bigger. So the volume hasn't really gone down. In 2019, it was 24 billion. So, the, of course, um, things kept being built, the automation was still on the rise. There were very few uh, construction zones in Germany, too, that had to really uh, stop operations during the pandemic. And the pandemic leads us to our first thesis that our first guest has brought with her, Julia Arlinghaus. Like I said, she's the head of the Fraunhofer Institute in Magdeburg, and she's also a professor for production systems and automation at the University of Magdeburg. And she's brought the uh, first thesis um, with uh, her. She's saying that Corona hasn't really led to a great awakening because the big automation drivers are already well-known factors. How do you mean that? Well, I think Corona basically only accelerated and um, has made our problems bigger, really. Um, and we're seeing them more clearly. We've had more crises before we've had the time of America first, we've had Fukushima. So a lot of businesses had to deal with resilience before, but now we have this big significance that the significance of logistics as a whole, I think has become quite painfully clear to a lot of us and also has become clear to us as end customers because at the beginning of the pandemic, we were afraid of running out of um, uh, toilet paper. And now I know my son is fearing that that he will not get a PlayStation 5 for Christmas because they can't deliver them. So now we're all in agreement that we have a problem and that we're lacking transparency and digitization. And on the other hand, it's basically like a looking glass, but also we're always keeping one eye shut because we are refusing to look at what's behind this big problem. We are seeing that the businesses 
should have dealt with all these issues much before, but basically we're lacking foundations for digitizations. What did we do during the crisis? We had huge IT projects that were being slowed down. We realized that we didn't have our own capital for that. So we didn't really seize the opportunities to create the foundations that we're now painfully lacking. I'm working with companies who I'm trying to convince to maybe use Excel sheets instead of papers. So this is where we're at. And the ones that have SAP systems still have so many interfaces that they can't get a grip on the whole thing. Uh, but then we've got other things like the Value Chain um, Act that's just been released. And we they will affect all of us, also the small operators. And if we look at the shortage of skilled workers and all the other challenges we're facing, I think it's clear that we need these foundations in order to have scalable digitization. Talking about a shortage of skilled workers, Kevin, you said that your company basically had a lockdown overnight and then people started ordering stuff online and Hermes couldn't really get a grip on the situation because you weren't able to just you know hire another thousand people, right? Indeed, um, uh, Corona, of course, caught us by surprise, um, as it did everyone. The um, delivery changed and the supply chains got disrupted. We had to face the challenge of how to switch to an online business uh, from being a purely offline business. And we were basically uh, frozen in shock at first. We had to make sure that we could keep our warehouses open, that we could keep our locations open. We also didn't know, you know, how the situation would change if there were going to be more political changes, etc. But in retrospect, I think it was a great experience. It was painful, but it has brought about necessary changes. Because we were lucky enough that we collaborated with a lot of large companies and online players as partners. And we we went the extra mile. We um, said that, okay, in the first phase, this was a capacity issue. And then in the ne next phase, we realized that it had become a service aspect and we could care about how to make our customers happy. We collaborated really closely with our partners and we, we seized these painful experiences to learn from them. And I do think that today um, we are stronger than before, than ever before, really. And customer satisfaction is at the core of our service range. And I think that is, for us as a service provider, this has been a great step because you know, many years ago, our, our priorities were different. We looked at, you know, inventories and we basically only looked at efficiency and we sort of overlooked the customer and their satisfaction. And I think the last uh, 18 months have shown us very clearly that we need to change this. And then fulfillment at, and logistics were both the, the most essential uh, success factors that we could have. But had you not been so automated, I think your situation would have been different, no? Yes, definitely. Um, our lake location is close to, to Magdeburg. We have the, um, the Hamburg port really close to us. So we started early on in the 90th, 90s to, to work with automation, and we're still advancing that. But of course, the new challenges in terms of uh, scaling still apply to us as well. Regardless, without automation, we had we would not have been able to scale up just as rapidly as we did. And we would not have been able to, to tackle these challenges the way we did. But from a manufacturer's side, I do have to say that we did um, face the concern that because of automation, scaling up is often prevented because you always try to adapt adapt to certain expectations. And then if you suddenly face this extreme growth that was very surprising due to the pandemic, um, the fact is often that many companies tell us that, that automation uh, serves as a kind of blockage, yet you are saying that it helped you scale up. Well, I think this has to do with how audacious you really are and um, how, how early do you try to make changes. And we're really happy with the automations that we have in place. 
And of course, it could have been 10 or 20 percent more. But I think this is a question that we have to ask ourselves. What are our potential? How easily can I acquire new staff? It's not just about finding new staff, new personnel, but also, you know, the infrastructure plays a role. It's not just finding people. It's also about how to provide the infrastructure that all these people will need. And that's where automation can help us. And I think to us as a fulfillment service provider, this is a new path that we're forging. If we have to, you know, meet our employees halfway. We have to convince them that we are their friends, that we want to help them travel with us along this path. This is the only way we can survive and um, and also um, be successful. I think that's another thing that the pandemic has shown us, that we have a lot of leaders these days who do say this, who are behind their staff and who believe in automation to, to foster good cooperation with their staff. And I think this is another thing that will help us post-corona to, to continue uh, to, strive, to, to thrive. Yes, definitely. Scaling up and down is, is definitely something that um, has affected us all, large companies and small ones alike. And the, the great awakening that you described when it comes to automation and the question of how we can scale up or down is something that has become a lot more clear and, and a much more present topic for any manufacturers. Now manufacturers are considering maybe renting material and equipment. Five years ago, this would have been completely unthinkable, um, but this has changed considerably um, thanks to the pandemic. And today, the debates are in the industry are, are completely different. People are a lot more open and they say, yes, we do need to consider um, if we might need FTS or HGV um, that we might want to um, offer to our customers. And I think before the pandemic, uh, people would have negated that much more clearly. And I think it's clear that you as the businesses are going through a lot of change, but we as manufacturers as well. And I, yeah, I do think that this market is definitely evolving. We did a small survey at the beginning of the year, and there were at least um, 20 startups that are dealing with AGV. Um, but for users, at the same time, users of these systems, um, there is a certain risk to use uh, these systems. And that's why we also see very different manufacturers or OEMs who also say, no, we're going to go for an individual solution for our individual needs. And that's what I mean, you know, standardization does play a role here and is gaining importance, but um, as, as a whole industry, I think we do have to do our homework when it comes to that and to, to come back to this thesis that standardization is still definitely needed with all these new systems. And you just mentioned um, um, manufacturers renting equipment. So we are seeing new business models um, sprouting up really like mushrooms all over the place in many different areas of production, you know, um, paper use, for example. And this is where smart maintenance comes in and where, where they are becoming more and more popular because at the end of the day it comes down to availability for the users. At the same time though we have to say that these are very highly individualized solutions. These are not standard products and from what I know I think the, the fastest lead time for these uh, products is six weeks when it comes to renting equipment and if we say that we have to wonder how realistic it actually actually is that the um, providers of such solutions are able to survive during you know the Christmas business for example when when demand is so much higher so I think um, we can't be too hopeful there that you know um, during the upcoming Christmas business that you can just rent automated vehicles and equipment I think we will continue to need humans yes definitely and it depends of course there are some things that are much easier to rent yeah you can just if you need another large warehouse, it's easy to, you know, just rent another building. It doesn't take a lot of imagination for that. But when it comes to FTS and EMA, of course, this has been um, a hot topic recently, and that's a, a whole different issue. And there are and there are openings when it comes to the interface side. We have software platforms, for example, we're trying to have software platforms, and we would like to rent out vehicles from different manufacturers. So uh, people don't depend on just one single manufacturer, for example, because that makes 
makes customers more flexible and enables them to be more neutral. They're not dependent on, on one manufacturer. They have the software competence and then the vehicles that they rent are basically commodities. Uh, and that, yeah, that um, enables flexibility. All right, this was a lot of topics. Um, interfaces is something we'll um, come back to later, but let's take a step back. Marina Hein, um, in your position, I think you work with a lot of international key accounts um, with um, various different um, demands. So, this brings us to our thesis. You said that um, some companies don't really do their homework properly. Um, what do you mean by that? I, I, I really like the headline of your session that, you know, a, a lousy job done with digitization is still just a lousy job. Because there are companies that are very interested in digitization and they approach us as manufacturers, but they are not aware of what it actually means for a company, for a business. You can't just approach you know some provider of digitization and uh, tell them well I would like my warehouse to be automated and I've been talking to customers who are you know still using papers to do their calculations and that's the next step I would like a robotic vehicle because that's that's you know it's a path to get there and it requires effort and you have to be aware of this effort and if companies are not ready to also invest the adequate planning capacity then, you know, that is going to get really difficult and no provider will be able to fix that for a company. And that's what I mean with homework. These companies have to do their homework. They have to be aware of the project um, progress. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. You have to have your processes under control. And if you're not ready to do that and to make this investment, I think it will be a very, um, a very a stony path or it's not even possible. But I'm a big believer in, in being very open about this, you know, because quite often, customers um, come come to us with shiny eyes and say, well, tomorrow I would like everything automated. And um, then I ask very clear questions uh, because automation can only ever reflect um, what processes have been existence before that. It, it can't just be created out of nothing. And we have to we have to talk to these customers who are not aware of this. The thing that we can do with automation is basically forcing businesses to start dealing with these processes, and that can be very motivating. That can be definitely an incentive, you know, because businesses then become aware that uh, that so many of the processes are still being done manually and um, require much more effort. And then offering them possibilities of automation is a good thing. And and then they are forced to do their homework and to look into this. And then I think we will definitely be able to realize great automated processes. Julia, you are approaching this from a very um, um, scientific uh, point of view. What is your experience? What kind of lead times do you see? What do the customers think? Well, we did look at around 300 digitization projects from a science point of view. And what we saw is that that good project management is severely lacking. So uh, especially in the early phases of every project, people simply forget that a lot of technologies are just not that advanced yet. Yes, they are advanced and more advanced than 20 years ago, but they're still not quite where we need them to be. And we have to make people aware of them um, if they want to use them. We have to make them aware of what they can do if you know the technology fails all of a sudden. And what we saw is that around 50 out of the 300 um, projects um, encounter problems because people um, are very hesitant to deal with this new technology. And that's something we can deal with very easily with professional project management, with sufficient resources um, that the company provides. So the company has to be aware of the resources it's putting in there. And then, and that sounds a bit silly, but we have to pick up people where they are. Basically, that means to maybe approaching the work council beforehand, approaching the IT department before you start, um, 
you know, distributing smart um, 3D glasses among the staff. That's really important. And something, it's the little things that are so often overlooked. Kevin, yeah. That's definitely a lot of uh, interesting points. Kevin, a question to you. Have you done your homework at Hammers? We all know that you do a lot of large projects, huge projects, um, uh, sometimes ranging in the, you know, 1 billion euro marks. So these are huge, huge things. Do you think that you've done your homework, that you have done a good job doing your homework, or are you kind of overwhelmed with the huge volume that the, um, that the different uh, providers are, are bringing to the table now? Well, I do think that the the market is is a challenge. We have um, supply chain challenges. We have different other challenges. So. Um, it has all become a lot more complex than it was a number of years ago. And we as a fulfillment provider are committed to our partners and we want to promise them that their warehouses are available at a certain point. And what we see is, of course, in the industry that a lot of um, plant providers are completely fully booked. And it is important that uh, you know that there are sometimes also that there is a lack of employees. We have been cooperated with uh, established partners in the past, but we do see that they are facing bottlenecks at the moment. So uh, we are checking the market very carefully now and look as to who will be able to support us. And we are going to kick off with uh, various sites and we are going to invest a lot of money not only in the sites but also in digitalization as well as data analysis because um, I believe if we look at fulfillment, Hermes fulfillment, we are data giant. And uh, if you check our data, we would be able to tell you in how many sizes we delivered the red T-shirt two years ago. It is great that we do have this huge data, but the question is, how do we use the data? How do we work? with this data in our daily operations. And this will lead to active customer management. Who of our customers, who are the most important ones? Who needs to receive the shipment first? And uh, how can we optimize the use of our digitization of our plants? Our equipment is digital and a lot of data flows there. And uh, we have started thinking also to use our existing equipment to a better, in a better way in providing them with more data and using the data that we do have available. And so we are confident. We are confident, but the uh, market is still a huge uh, challenge at the moment. What do manufacturers tell you? What is the waiting time? How long will you have to wait for material? Well, this depends on the size. And uh, during the pandemic, we communicated that we are going to construct and establish two new sites that are highly automated and where we will have the focus on our customers, where we will focus on next day services and achieve a um, performance rate of more than 70% here. And these are systems that uh, exceed the possibilities of our competitors, of many of our competitors, and uh, it will take two or three years to implement this project. So this is what we are assuming at the moment. We are very lucky at Hermes Fulfillment that we do have partners with a lot of know-how, a lot of expertise that can provide a lot of input work. But we are currently conducting many negotiations, are engaged in various talks, but some tell us that they do not have the material, do not have the stuff. And uh, well, so we are currently checking our partner portfolio very carefully and try to find out whether perhaps we can approach in a different way. And at the end of the day, we do not uh, automate for the sake of automation, but for the sake of the, of the customer. We want to create benefit for the customers. So we always look at what our end consumers need, what do they require and then try to find the perfect solution for that and that will be the basis for all of our automation efforts but as i said we have learned a lot over the past few years and we have learned our lessons and the focus and this is one of the lessons we have learned the focus is on the customer yes what i can hear from what you say is uh, the data well at hermes you have a wealth of data you have excellent engineers so you can work with what you have 
So you are in a very good position to kick off automation, to start uh, automation. You not only have the capital, but you also have the performance and uh, the data available. It is far more critical if you have a smaller sized company. That process is only a few hundred shipments per day. And uh, suddenly, this company will be faced with huge costs. And uh, sometimes, these companies will look at automation solutions that will only pay off after as, or at a certain level. So this is something that you have to look at. So Hermes is in the lucky position to have the performance, to have the data. and. Uh, has resource available that they have developed over the years. And that this is something that they can invest in automation. Yes, you also mentioned something very important, namely a tendency that we have seen over the past few years. Our focus is, a, is B2C business. We focus on fashion, living, lifestyle, digital media. These are the areas where we are very successful to provide fulfillment services. So five, six years ago, many companies said, well, I do need my own warehouse. This will make me more competitive. I will become the big player on the market. But you have to be clear. Either you are a big company and you have a critical mass and you are a big player in the market. And if you are not, then you really have to think whether it will pay off to bind capital in a fulfillment solution because you will not provide the same service as a big competitor. So this is what you have to consider. As Hermes, we are in a position where we are market leader in some areas. It is an end-to-end -end logistic chain where, that we can use and benefit of. Some other brands and uh, traders will not be in this position. And so you have to ask yourself the, to ask yourself the question, do I go for multi-vendor setup? And or maybe use a different approach and not do everything myself. Yeah, you also brought a thesis with you. You are relatively new in the company as CEO of Hermes Fulfillment. You only started this year. You are mid-30 and are being faced with major challenges. Before that, you worked in the Otto Group and were in charge of various of supply fulfillment uh, areas. You were worked in Asia, and uh, you keep coming back to the customer, the customer in the focus of everything you do, of all your thinking and action. And this is also what your thesis is. You said the cu end customer is not only king, he's also disloyal and unfaithful and does not forgive broken promises. What do you mean by that? Well, we mentioned earlier what we noticed during the pandemic was that logistics is an important part of the customer journey in the online business. And the logistics process is the only process in online trade that you can really, that is really tangible. The courier will hand over a package. This is the last step in this chain. And what we see is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the focus in the past few years was mainly on productivity, on numbers. Our dealers told us, well, if you agree to one euro, then we do the business with you. If you charge 110, then we go and work with a competitor. So what we try to find out how to measure customer satisfaction and we check what is our promise, our delivery promise, what were we able to uh, keep in terms of promises, what do customers expect and what do they want. Sometimes we had months where we said, well, uh, we were excellent, our performance was great, but the customer didn't agree. So we have to check what didn't work. Was it an interface, for example? Sometimes we would have 
packaged everything correctly, but then delivered them efficiently. So there was a lack of or loss of efficiency somewhere along the line. So the speed that we have in e-commerce at the moment, and this is also due to the pandemic, is facing us with major challenges. Forecast models that worked until recently no longer work because of the high degree of volatility. So these were some areas and aspects where we used net promoter scores and the standard KPIs. Um, also add the end customer into the focus also of our employees. Tell them, well, you may pack and wrap one million packages a day, but there is always a customer behind it. There is this person who ordered it. So this is something that you always have to take into account. And we see that if our performance is not excellent, the customer will tell us off. And uh, we do have many loyal customers because, as I said, we have this excellent service that we are able to provide. And we notice that when the service is excellent, the customer satisfaction is also very high. So this was a major challenge for us to focus more and more on the end consumer. Well, many service providers or suppliers say that the focus on the consumer, but you have to look at it critically. And in many cases, you will see that this is not the case, that they are not true. And I think this makes the difference. And this will also make the difference uh, after post-corona. Uh, well, I liked what you mentioned, that the uh, mentioned the employees that you tell them how important the end consumer is. Let me ask you, what is the influence of the employee? If you have a high degree automation system, then you have a structure of various processes that have to go hand in hand for everything to work out properly. So how do the employees respond if they are suddenly faced with numbers and figures? Then as an employer, I, employee, I would say, well, what can I do about that? All I do is wrap the Thing. Uh, yes, of course, you have to put this at a more abstract level. You cannot say, uh, well, the promoter score is at 70. No, you have to explain it to the employees. But if we have uh, somebody at the control center, then we tell these people, you play an important role. What you do is important, but you also have to tell the people working in packages that they have an important role to play. And uh, so tell them, well, if you make a mistake and if you realize that it's not the blue t-shirt, but the red t-shirt that you should pack, and if you notice that this is wrong, then this will make a difference. And I think I think it is important that we talk to the employees, tell them, look, this is some, this is an example where we exceeded, and this is a, an area where we should improve. And this means enable your employee to give feedback. For example, say at the end of the day, well, maybe I, I was given fewer articles today and uh, tell this to your supervisor uh, and then analyze that. F try to find out the reason why an employee processed fewer articles on a given day. So I think the development of teams is an important success factor factor, an success factor to develop teams further. Uh, we are, you have to add emotion and bring emotion to the business. If people are emotional, they will enjoy the job and they will also perform better. Let us take a step back. Marina, one of your theses was if the automation providers do not change their, their attitude, their mindset, said they will be pushed out of the market. What do you mean by that? Well, Julia mentioned that there are various startups, uh, not only in the past two years, I would say over the past five years, we have seen many startups, and then there are automated, uh, sorry, well established automation providers who have been on the market for various years. And what we see is that many demands of consumers are fulfilled better by startups. Some established companies do not even have what the customer wants at this moment. So this is where we need more openness. What we had in the past was a situation where partners were loyal, 
level where you would decide that you, you cooperate with just one business partner and the entire project with software expertise, plant construction, all of this will be purchased from one hand, a one-stop shop. This is something that a startup cannot provide. But now what we see is that the challenges are increasing, customers uh, approach established suppliers and request some new things and ask them why are you not able to provide that and startups are more agile here so it is decisive that the established the big supplies uh, suppliers become more flexible and that they have to find responses to new demands to new requirements of course if you are a big company you do have advantages you have more partners you can fall back on uh, more than an, a startup, but you have to be alert, you have to see what startup companies are doing, and there are some great companies that uh, enjoy uh, growth rates, and they have become established companies, uh, and only were startups yesterday, so this is something that we have to take into account. And uh, yeah, while in China and other countries, uh, there are also many players who are active in this part. Yeah, yes, I, of course, agree, and I observe that. And the established suppliers do have the benefit of size, and uh, sometimes they have to tell their customers, well, uh, a startup will not be able to do that. Um, but And another aspect is that startups may not survive four or five years, and what then? And then you have to again, uh, take another decision. So I think the established suppliers are still in an advantageous position because of their size. But we do see that many new companies are entering the market. And we also see that there is also increasing uh, demands. And what we also see is an increasing rate of consolidation in the market. So some interesting constellations evolve where some companies by other suppliers where they purchase digitalization, for example. We see that that uh, forklift producers are now purchasing from automation providers because it's very difficult to um, find the right partners in the market, so they are uh, outsourced. And this consolidation is going to continue also in the future. And you have to be modest. And you cannot say, well, we were successful and we have been successful for 30, 20 years now and that will always continue like that. No, you have to be uh, modest and you have to be agile. Agility is a good term, a catchphrase, as well as flexibility and scalability because there are always uh, modifications in demand, fluctuations in, in requirements. So uh, what is the mindset with regard to flexibility? Um, what is needed in terms of scalability as far as AGVs and FTAs and etc. is concerned. Well, I do not think that we will be able to come to term with these huge market fluctuations over the year that we see. And what's more, at the moment, we have these raw material bottlenecks. So I think we need to, or there will be a uh, change in my sets that's required and I think there are the first movements of standardization that we are noticing now and what we also see at the interface of man and machine that there are major advancements and developments of technology so that machine and man and man and machine can work hand in hand and we will need that man is the most flexible element element in the change, and uh, it is the element that can be scaled the fastest. Let me come back to the uh, consolidation. Um, VDA 5050 comes to mind here. Do you think that this will bring a shift in paradigm? Well, I think it will be a first step. This new communication standard will make it possible for various FTSs 
as of different suppliers to cooperate. And I think it's the right step, the first right step into the right correction. And FDS, I'm sure, will also be transferable to other systems. I don't know how you see that. Yes, I think this is a very specific uh, topic. But if we look at highly automated warehouses, then we see that various systems cooperate and communicate with each other. The new communication standard will make it easier to map this M2M communication because this is highly complex. Our fulfillment centers employ many, many IT experts who keep these fulfillment centers running. And I believe that there some things will become easier in future, and we will certainly see major developments in this area as well. Julia, you, your final thesis was that we tend to forget the human factor in automation. What do you think, what will the future bring? There is always mentioning of uh, factories uh, that are void of people where nobody works anymore. That's a nightmare for me personally. Uh, I believe that automation Automation and securing jobs is something that needs to be linked together in a positive way. And uh, my colleague here said something similar earlier. I think if we manage in creating a system where people will be ready to accept responsibility, where they will be given more interesting, more creative jobs, and uh, then this will lead to a more motivated workforce and the performance will increase. And this is a great opportunity, I would say. And digitization um, offers a great possibility here because it makes it possible to develop people further. And that's what people keep asking me. How, how will this come about? Well, um, I come from a consulting background. I optimized warehouses and I worked with people who uh, were illiterate or who were not able to speak German. And uh, even against this background, um, we were successful because we had automation and were able to offer different approaches and solutions to this. Uh, warehouses. I am convinced that this is also a possibility to retain talent in a region. For example, Magdeburg, this is an area that uh, suffered from brain drain uh, over the past few years. The companies have difficulties finding people and I believe if we are able to create jobs in this area, then uh, this would be great, wouldn't it? And uh, I think this is something that should also be possible at a high wage uh, location as we have here in Germany. That's one of the things that you keep always hear. What will happen with the poor staff if you automate? Uh, well, a control center will not work without a person operating it. So. It, Automation does not automatically need, uh, mean that you need no employees anymore. No, you will just have different jobs for them. They will have more demanding jobs. And it is not the case that automation will substitute the entire workforce. So there needs to be an understanding that you need people controlling, operating, uh, maintaining the system. So it will still be the people who have to perform decisive tasks. I think that was a very nice uh, conclusion. We learned that we will need people also in future. We will have to train them. Also here in Germany, um, development, additional training, all of this would be an interesting topic. But unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for contributing to this discussion. Thank you to our visitors online. You can uh, watch all these discussion rounds online. And tomorrow at 11, there will be another talk on safety in the warehouse. And we see you there. Thank you.